Hello, everybody in Manila, and to our viewers, wherever you're watching this, I'm Zainab Badawi. Welcome to the Asian Development Bank's 55th annual meeting of the Board of Governors, which is being held in a hybrid format in Manila. This is the second year of our curtain raiser chat with President Masatsugu Asakawa. Last year, Manila, like everywhere else, was still in lockdown and the threat of COVID loomed in Asia and right across the world. Today, we see how the vaccine rollout has changed the trajectory of the pandemic. And while COVID is still around, life has gradually gone back to normal in a lot of countries in the Asia Pacific region. But new challenges have emerged with the Russian invasion of Ukraine in February this year, for instance. And here to talk about the work of the Asian Development Bank in addressing these challenges in the region is the ADB president, Masatsugu Asakawa, better known, of course, as President Massa for short. Hello, President Massa. Greetings from London to you in Manila. It's great to see you again, albeit virtually for now. And as you can all see, thanks to technology, you and I, President Massa, seem to be in one location having a chat. But in fact, I'm here in London and you're in Manila. Lovely to see you. How are you? Yeah, thank you, uh, Zenat. I'm also delighted to see you once again after one year. Yeah. And also, especially this year, I'm really looking forward to seeing you in person. Absolutely. It's been quite a year, hasn't it, actually, President Massa, since we last yeah, spoke? That's I mean, right. you took yeah. over in 2020, January, when, you know, COVID was going to be going to be causing you lots and lots of challenges. And it just seems to go on and on for you. I mean, we're seeing new challenges emerge, which we'll be talking about in the course of our conversation. But just give me an overview. How are you doing and how's the bank? <laughs> Thank you. Well, a couple of things. First of all, uh, you know, I have uh, served in office as AD president for over two years now. First, I would like to really you know, appreciate all the member countries who supported my re-election uh, last year. So this is my second term already. And secondly, I am extremely uh, proud of what we achieved and how we delivered our operations to our DMCs in our region during the uh, you know, uh, pandemic period. And I'm so thankful and grateful to our the dedication of our uh, professionalism of, of our staff uh, who made it uh, possible. Like you mentioned for the uh, you know, uh, recent two years and a half, actually I saw almost nobody working he here in this building. Mm. So our headquarters has been shut down. Mm. Uh, but uh, due to the improvement of uh, COVID-19 situation in uh, Manila and the Philippines, we are now returning uh, to headquarters finally after two years and a half. So I'm so excited to see my staff in my office, in the corridor, in cafeteria, you know, face to face. Yeah, I bet. So, as we said, it's been quite a year. We've seen a lot of upheavals on the um, world stage. You know, the Russian invasion of Ukraine has helped trigger an energy crisis. We see rising inflation. We see food insecurity. We'll talk all about all that in a moment. But just first of all, tell us, what does the energy crisis mean for developing Asia? Not only energy crisis, but also food crisis is there and the COVID-19 yeah. threat is still there. Uh, actually, uh, develop, developing Asia experienced a negative economic growth rate of uh, negative 0.8% in 2020. Uh, due to COVID-19 pandemic. And it was the very first uh, economic contraction uh, happened in this area uh, for the last 60 years. And 2021, it rebounded mm. to 6.9%. And uh, this year, 2022, ADB project 4.3%. And uh, the reason for the rebound we saw last year includes a couple of things. First, uh, the very mild health impact of Omicron variants and second, uh, progress of vaccination in this area. And third, very robust, strong performance of export uh, from uh, this region. However, uh, the pace to recovery uh, in the various uh, among economies remain, remain very, very uneven among economies. So we, we have to uh, bear in mind, uh, I think, four uh, possible downside risks to the economic outlook of this region. First is, you know, slowing down of China's economy mm. due to the very stringent uh, zero corona policy. Mm. And second, still a possibility of emerge of the more lethal uh, COVID-19 uh, variant. And thirdly, uh, economic negative impact uh, caused by the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, as you, you mentioned, mm. Zena. Mm. 
And fourthly, you know, kind of instability in the financial market mm. uh, due to the a very aggressive, rapid, you know, uh, monetary policy normalization by uh, some uh, advanced economies. Mm. Okay, yeah, you've g given us an overview there of, of just, you know, what the situation is like globally and what it means for, for Asia. Let's just quickly go back then to um, COVID. You mentioned the slowdown in China, and of course we are still seeing lockdowns regionally in parts mm. of Asia, including particularly in China. So how much is COVID still a priority for you at the Asian Development Bank? Mm. Yeah, thanks. In fact, uh, uh, as everybody knows, uh, uh, the uh, Omicron uh, outbreaks has been very short-lived uh, in general and uh, milder than the previous waves. And uh, actually, the number of COVID-19 uh, uh, cases in this region have uh, dramatically uh, dropped, declined. And the ADB also responded very quickly uh, to this pandemic. In April 2020, uh, we announced the $20 billion uh, COVID-19 uh, comprehensive assistance package. And also in December in the same year, 2020, we uh, announced additional financial instrument uh, for procurement of vaccines by DMC at uh, developed member countries uh, with the amount of $9 billion. So far, uh, in total, uh, we uh, have committed $33 billion US dollars to support our DMCs, developed member countries, uh, to fight against COVID-19 pandemic. Mm. And out of this $33 billion, $10 billion uh, dollars, uh, was for very quick disbursing uh, budget financing called CIPRO, C-P-R-O, uh, COVID-19 pandemic response option. And $8 billion dollars was for uh, private sector financing, including very short-term uh, trade financing. And $4 billion was for uh, vaccine financing. From now on, as you mentioned, Zena, mm. uh, we are not completely out of woods mm. yet. Mm. Uh, so we will continue to provide those budget financing, private sector financing, and also vaccine financing in addition uh, to the uh, ordinary uh, project financing as necessary. Yeah, you're right. I mean, people talk about, oh, the post-COVID world and so on, but we still see travel restrictions in the Asia Pacific region, which has particularly had an impact on those countries that rely a lot on tourism, for instance, you know, in some mm. cases that's not gone back to what it was like in pre-pandemic levels. So very interesting to know that the Asian Development Bank is still very much, you know, thinking about how to deal with the fallout from COVID. But you also mentioned one of the challenges as a result of the um, Russian invasion of Ukraine, of course, mm. Ukraine, a big supplier of grain and so on globally. This has had a big impact on food prices in a lot of countries mm. in the Asia Pacific region, especially those that rely a lot on food imports and also the strength of the dollar, you know, has sent these food bills soaring. And we're seeing a lot of food insecurity, sadly, which is going to fuel inequality, which I know, President Massa, is something which is very important to you, wanting to close, mm -hmm. you know, the, the gap between the, the haves and the have-nots. So how can your region deal both in the short and long term with this food insecurity, food crisis? Yeah, very important point. Actually, uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine have posed a serious, very serious risk mm. uh, to the economic outlook of this region, obviously. Uh, there are you know, two, two kinds of risks. You know, one is in indirect impact and uh, 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 direct impact and indirect impacts. Mm -hmm. And direct impact through you know, trade, uh, capital transaction with uh, Russia, and also remittance coming from Russia has been relatively uh, limited for uh, developing Asia as a whole except for a couple of countries in Central Asia, Caucasus and Mongolia, mm. who have traditionally uh, maintained a very uh, close uh, trade and economic linkage with Russian Federation. On the other hand, uh, the indirect impact, in, in, indirect risk has been looked through very, very steep price increase in food and energy. I'm quite sure uh, importers, import countries of uh, food and energy uh, will see uh, uh, you know, this year's uh, import bill are much, much you know, more expensive than last year's, which means you know, adding uh, inflationary pressure on the economy. And actually, uh, many, a number of uh, central banks in this region has already started to raise its policy interest rate to quell the inflation pressure, which would uh, uh, additional you know, constraint on economic growth uh, perspective of this region. Mm. And also, indirect impact includes 
uh, the kind of deterioration of market sentiment, which might, which would uh, depress uh, consumers, uh, producers, and investors' confidence. So safety, uh, well, flight to safety and uh, tighter financial uh, conditions globally uh, might spur uh, some sort of in the capital outflow movement uh, from this uh, region. Together with uh, the steep increase in uh, food prices, the possible reduction of fertilizer supply mm. by Russia mm. uh, would have a you know, significant, impact, mm. significant impact on the agricultural production of this region as well. And uh, this has become a very serious concern in terms of uh, food security, as you mentioned, mm. rightly. So this is exacerbating uh, the already challenging situation due to the uh, you know, economic fallout of COVID-19, some political unrest, notably in Afghanistan and Myanmar, and uh, droughts and uh, other uh, adverse weather events are linked to climate uh, change. And uh, in response, ADB uh, tried to you know, uh, respond to these new challenges uh, you know, uh, through uh, various measures. Uh, we will continue to provide you know, uh, the ordinary uh, project financing, policy-based loan, uh, budget financing, and also uh, financing for private sector. And quite recently, uh, we uh, have enhanced our existing, one of our existing uh, financial instruments called CSL, Counter Cyclical Support uh, Facility, mm. uh, which would provide uh, emergency uh, in financing to support the DMCs to expand their counter cyclical uh, fiscal expenditure to mitigate the shocks uh, coming from uh, you know, uh, external uh, events like uh, food insecurity issues mm. and so on. Mm. Uh, those are the short term measures, but in long term, mm. we are reviewing now our project in our pipeline for DMCs to see how we can support our DMCs to build very strong, robust, and sustainable food systems mm. uh, through climate smart agriculture, digitalization of uh, foods, uh, food value chain, and nature-based solutions. Yeah, interesting. You talk about the direct and the indirect impacts, but also the short-term emergency responses that you're making at the Asian Development Bank for those countries that really need assistance, but how it's also influencing your long-term goals and the importance of putting in place those building blocks to ensure that in the long term you do have food security, as you say, through climate smart agriculture and so on so very interesting that it has you know really concentrated your minds in making sure that you do try to go down that path so you mentioned it's not just the um, russian invasion which has triggered the food crisis it was a perfect storm wasn't it president massa we saw as you said those extreme climatic conditions mm -hmm. You know, we've seen the floods in South Asia with hundreds of thousands of people affected in Pakistan. We've seen the droughts in many parts of China. I believe the Yangtze River is at its lowest level since 1865. I mean, that's quite extraordinary, isn't it? So I know that you're obviously really at the forefront of thinking about climate change at the Asian Development Bank. You went to COP26 in Glasgow in Scotland and um, you are very much involved in the ETM, the Energy Transition Mechanism, which is trying to accelerate the move away from fossil fuels towards clean energy. And you're working with your international and regional partners uh, um, to that end. We all know that energy demand is going to double in Asia by 2030. So I, I want to know just um, what you're doing to try to support the ETM, the energy transition mechanism, to not only build back better, but build back greener. Mm. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Zainab. Yeah, as you mentioned, you know, it's a kind of uncomfortable truth that this region, Asian Pacific region, is accountable for more than half of the global yeah. uh, green gas, greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah. And also it's true uh, that this region remains as one of the most vulnerable region against uh, natural, natural disasters. So I keep on saying that our fight against uh, you know, uh, climate change in this region uh, will be won or lost. Last year you know, was a year of COP26 and I, I went to Glasgow. So before uh, I went to Glasgow, we had a serious discussion inside the bank to discuss what kind of contribution ADB could make, ADB should make. And we, we made a couple of very important decisions. First, 
uh, climate financing. Uh, we elevated our ambition from 80 billion US dollars to 100 US dollars, 100 billion US dollars of cumulative climate uh, uh, financing uh, from 2019 to 2030. So 100 billion US dollars over those uh, uh, 12 years, uh, which is a big challenge for us. But we see also our investment in green growth is an opportunity uh, to keep advancing de development, uh, to reduce poverty, uh, while uh, maintaining uh, our, our path uh, for a uh, low carbon transition. Second, we need to uh, enhance the access to affordable, reliable, and sustainable energy source while promoting a low carbon transition. So to that end, we devised ADB's so-called energy policy, which is very old. Mm -hmm. And uh, this new uh, energy policy we adopted before COP26 last year. And under that new policy, we officially decided to withdraw our financing uh, for uh, any new uh, coal-fired power plants. And also, this new uh, energy policy uh, commits ADB uh, to uh, support a just transition for all the people in the affected communities. And thirdly, ETM. You know, uh, we are, including ETM, we are working on a couple of very innovative financing instruments, but ETM is one of them. The issue is as follows, Zenavi. In our region, there are so many, you know, uh, coal-fired power plants mm. already existing mm. and operating. Mm. So many, and they are relatively young. Mm. Young means less than 20 years old. 90% mm. of those young mm. uh, coal-fired power plants are said to be here in Asia. So unless we don't do anything, they just stay on for another 10 years, 20 years, and even 30 years from now. So what we need is to let them retire early, earlier than originally scheduled. So ETM will do that job. ETM is a very you know, innovative financing mechanism which combines commercial financing provided by financial institutions with highly concessional financing or grant money provided by donor countries or philanthropies. It's called branded financing uh, to uh, achieve uh, low cost financing. And by utilizing those low cost financing, uh, you know, uh, any expected return uh, from each coal fired power plant uh, could be achieved in a shorter uh, time horizon. That's how ETM uh, could uh, let uh, those existing uh, coal fired power plants retire early. Mm. Also, ETM would unlock investment in renewable energy clean energy so that they can promote the thermal transition from coal to renewable energy in each country. We are piloting ETM in uh, Philippines, Indonesia, and Vietnam right now. And our work in Indonesia is truly leading in mm -hmm. the context of their presidency for uh, G20 this year. And I'm quite sure this is going to successful uh, model in uh, uh, this region, in the Asian Pacific region, then it could be, it should be replicated in other parts of the world, mm. like in the African continent, mm. uh, in the South American continent, and so on. Mm. And I hope this ETM uh, will become one of the most powerful powerful uh, carbon uh, reduction model in the world. Really fascinating. I mean, it's clearly a very visionary and ambitious program you have with the energy transition mechanism. So really fascinating, and True. as you say, You've got this pilot project, and it will be interesting for other regions in the world to see how you do proceed with that. So I, I think that's um, a, a very, very innovative thing you're doing there at the Asian Development Bank. So talking about the importance of investment and so on, especially when it comes to climate or addressing the food um, a crisis, when we spoke last year, I know you're very passionate about this topic, um, domestic resource mobilization. You spent many years in the <laughs> Ministry of Finance in, um, in, in your native Japan. But, you know, talking about all these things, you know, one says to you, President Massa, how can you say that domestic resource mobilization, taxation and so on is a priority for you at the Asian Development Bank, given all these challenges? Mm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, this is really one of my most favorite topics. Yeah. Well, you know, due to the long-lasting uh, low in, uh, interest rate environment and also physical expansion to deal with uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic, almost in every country, fiscal situation got worsened. Fiscal situation means in fiscal deficit, deficit mm -hmm. situation and also public debt situation. Mm -hmm. uh, that was inevitable in a sense. 
But, in, but I'm quite sure that in the process of recovery from pandemic, I think timing would come to every country uh, to change the gears uh, from fiscal expansion to fiscal consolidations. Of course, each country should pick up the right timing to do so. Timing cannot be too early, cannot be too late. Uh, but uh, I, I'm quite sure uh, the timing will come. Uh, so in that process, I think DRM, domestic resource mobilization, is very, very important, uh, which means how to raise domestic tax revenue. Uh, domestic resource mobilization, DRM, DRM, is significant from two perspectives. One is, it's very, very much necessary uh, to make a social welfare system of that country you know, uh, robust and financially viable. For example, aging. Aging is coming to every country sooner or later. And in order to cope with aging, what is needed is introduce a very well-designed and uh, robust uh, public pension scheme mm -hmm and also a public medical insurance mm. scheme, medical insurance scheme and so on, right? And in, in order to make those social welfare systems financially viable, it's much better to rely on domestic resources rather than depending too much on external financing. Mm. That would simply uh, worsen the debt situation, mm. debt sustainability of that country. Uh, secondly, tax policy is a uh, good policy not only to uh, in, uh, increase tax revenue in general, but to achieve each of the development agenda uh, read, read out uh, by SDGs. For example, it might be a good idea to utilize uh, progress, progressivity of the income tax scheme mm. to address income inequality mm. uh, issue, which I'm quite sure uh, got worse during the pandemic. Mm. And also, uh, it might be a, a feasible policy option to rely on uh, carbon tax, environmental tax, mm. to address climate change issue. So these are only you know, two examples, but uh, there are many ways where uh, tax policy can uh, contribute. Uh, to the long-term development agenda led out by SDGs. Yeah, very interesting how you say, you know, these fundamental services that governments provide, welfare, health care and so on, you can't rely on external finance for that and therefore you really have always been a very strong advocate, haven't you, of a progressive tax system um, because, as you say, to address the inequality, which sadly we've seen expand um, post, you know, during the COVID um, pandemic. But also talking about finance, there was this historic global tax agreement um, last year to make the international tax system fit for the 21st century's digitalized and globalized um, economy. So, so tell me, how can countries in the Asia Pacific region benefit from this global tax agreement, which is supposed to be implemented next year? And how can you at the Asian Development Bank support its implementation? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I really would like to emphasize the importance of international tax cooperation exemplified by you know, BEPS project, which you mentioned. A so-called two-tier approach, uh, which has been agreed by G20 and by a wider you know, group of countries, 130 plus uh, countries, uh, October last year was really epoch making. The second pillar, pillar two, uh, was striking in a sense that participating uh, sovereign nations all agreed that large multinational enterprises, MNEs, mm. should be taxed mm. at least 50% anywhere. Actually, it is uh, the first pillar, pillar one, uh, that would generate more tax revenue for developing countries. Uh, pillar one relocates taxation rights over those large uh, MNEs, uh, multinational enterprises, uh, from their uh, country of residence to the market economy where they do business and make profit. And there will be one of these days, mm. uh, they can make profit even without any physical presence in that country. Yeah, yeah we, we call it PE, uh, permanent establishment, but they can make profit even without any PE by utilizing digital technology, e-commerce, and so on. So pillar one would enable a market economy, including developing countries, to impose a fair amount of taxation uh, those multinational, ent multinational enterprises uh, without, uh, making profit without any PE. So I think uh, you know, de developing countries should really you know, take full advantage of this historical uh, agreement uh, to uh, ask a fair tax burden on digital economy. Yeah. 
And, uh, and as I mentioned, uh, you know, last year, uh, last year we launched the so-called uh, Digital Tax Hub, the ADB, uh, to promote tax uh, policy dialogue, promote coordination among uh, developing, developing partners, uh, knowledge sharing, and also promote a discussion on uh, international tax cooperation. So I hope uh, many countries will join this tax hub uh, to have a very active discussion on both DRM uh, domestic, res domestic resource mobilization and ITC, uh, international tax cooperation. Yeah. No, I, I knew about the digital tax hub and it is, it's really you know, good to know that, that you are really pursuing this with a lot of vigor. And of course, regional cooperation, coordination and integration has been so fundamental to what mm. is being done by the Asian Development Bank over the decades. And it's really been instrumental, hasn't it, in helping to lift millions of people out of poverty through you know cross-border trade and investment and all the rest of it but when you're talking about this tax hub and the need for international cooperation i wonder if you think that that's really viable given that particularly after covid you know we've seen a real retreat from globalization and people are looking at localization regionalization i mean you know some people are saying globalization is dead in all but name. What was your view? Yeah, I remember last year I mentioned, I said that globalization yeah. will come back. Yeah. And despite uh, the new challenges uh, has emerged due to the you know, <laughs> Russian invasion of Ukraine, I still think global, globalization will come back. And uh, if that's the case, uh, what we need to do is to you know, enhance our regional cooperation uh, which should be transparent and, uh, and open, and uh, that would support the, re the rejuvenated uh, globalization. Mm. Uh, more concretely, I can think of a couple of areas uh, where we, should, we could uh, enhance our regional uh, cooperation effort. Uh, first, obviously, uh, trade and in investment. Uh. Uh, we should restore our regional uh, trade, strong regional trade, uh, vibrant capital uh, transaction across uh, border, and also a uh, deep uh, regional value chain, which has been driving force uh, for the very uh, strong economic growth and economic, uh, economic uh, uh, transformation in this region for years. Despite uh, the border closure and uh, travel restraints uh, introduced uh, you know, during the COVID uh, period, uh, countries in this region have, have uh, reopened and reconnected already. Another good example is the signing of RCEP in uh, November to 2020. And actually, uh, RCEP itself has uh, become into effect uh, as of January 1st of this year. Uh, that was a very strong signal, a uh, strong commitment of the, by this region uh, for uh, the uh, open and free uh, trade uh, systems, trade and investment systems. Of course, we have to make sure uh, that benefit coming from uh, tr open trade system would lead to everybody, including uh, low-income countries, uh, land and or sea locked countries, small to medium sized enterprises, and vulnerable, vulnerable and poor. Second area is uh, that you know, we should really uh, enhance uh, our cooperation uh, to build resilience, especially against regional health uh, security risks. Mm. For example, coordination among uh, national, uh, national regulators and surveillance agencies uh, could be enhanced. Uh, to ensure exchange of information and uh, real-time real -time monitoring of emerging risks. Also, vaccination itself uh, could uh, be conducted more effectively regionally. And thirdly and finally, I, I think we should really enhance our, our, our regional financial uh, cooperation. Mm. I'm afraid the risk will continue for abrupt capital outflow and, uh, and or uh, strong currency depreciation uh, due to the very aggressive uh, you know, monetary policy uh, tightening, especially by F uh, Fed. Mm. Of course, uh, compared with uh, the days of ASEAN financial crisis, uh, 1997, 1998, in this region, uh, the current account position has been uh, improved and uh, foreign reserve has been accumulated sufficiently. So resilience as a system, as a whole, mm. uh, against uh, financial turmoil has been uh, enhanced compared to you know, uh, those days. Mm. But still, nonetheless, it's always uh, uh, better uh, to be vigilant against a very fragile capital movement, try to enhance our financial cooperation in our region, including 
that of ASEAN plus three. Yeah, very interesting. And you mentioned the Fed there, the Federal Reserve in the United States, of course, and the dollar is the strongest it has been for such a long time. I mean, years and years. And of course, that's causing a lot of problem for those countries in the Asia Pacific region, which are heavily indebted because, of course, it makes you know their debts so much more expensive and it causes lots of problems in the way that you've illustrated. But it's good to see that despite all the problems, you're still sticking to your guns, President Massa, that globalization, regionalization and regional cooperation <laughs> Is and, and coordination is still the answer, and that we shouldn't lose sight of that in all sorts mm -hmm. of ways. So, um, and I also remember, you know, when we spoke um, this time last year, you, you said that you'd been able to get around a little bit, but you did express your frustration that you weren't mm -hmm. able to go out to the region to meet your partners, you know, and also officials and um, politicians and so on. So. Restrictions have eased a bit, of course, in the past 12 months. So you've, start, you've been traveling quite a bit. So maybe just share some of your reflections on um, where you've been and why you've gone there and w what you've discovered. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I have resumed uh, going on a mission, uh, both to uh, uh, develop me developing member countries, DMCs, and also non-borrowing uh, member countries. For example, in March, I went to Sri Lanka uh, because the Sri Lanka was supposed to uh, host our annual meeting in Colombo in May this year. And obviously, uh, due to the you know, a very uh, difficult uh, economic uh, uh, circumstances they are facing, we had to postpone it. But uh, taking that opportunity, I visited one university in Colombo and met with a bunch of people, uh, boys and girls, uh, who were being trained uh, for the jobs in the uh, renewable energy sector. Uh, looking at their seriousness, and looking at their big smile in their faces, I strongly felt uh, that the uh, renewable energy sector could be a, a major pathway uh, for the bright future of Sri Lanka once the current economic difficulty is overcome. Also, I went to Uzbekistan to see a you know, great Silk Road area uh, where I once again strongly felt uh, the huge, huge you know, uh, potential for economic uh, regional cooperation. Uh, of that area. So all these experiences uh, reminded me uh, that the ADB success uh, will depend on individuals, you know, personnel uh, of the region, and also a trusted partnership, trusted presence of ADB in that region, which we have pro provided for the last 50 years. And all, I'm also happy to continue to do so under these very difficult circumstances. Mm. President Master, you talked about the uh, students at the university in Colombo in Sri Lanka. Despite all the problems that the country faces, having a smile on their face and still being optimistic about the future and engaging mm -hmm. with you, it's a bit like that. Despite the fact that you have got so many things you have to tackle, all the problems and the challenges, you always do it with a smile on your face and with a very, very human <laughs> touch. And um, I thank you very much. I've really enjoyed having this conversation with you. So until then, thank you so much indeed. It's been fascinating talking to you in this curtain raiser for this year's annual gathering. So it's goodbye from me to you. I'm here in London. You're in Manila. Doesn't look like it, but that's the way it is. So bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you, Zianav.